Hey, welcome to Pastor Reacts. This is an episode of a Facebook watch video that I randomly stumbled across because Facebook recommends all sorts of weird stuff like this. This video is called Eight Facts that About Jesus That Aren't Actually in the Bible. And it's from a group called Sunday Roast. I'm assuming that means that they are not into Jesus. Uh, so I'm going to guess that this is going to land in the same quality of critique about Scripture or about Jesus that um, a lot of Internet anti-Christian commentators um, land on, which is kind of not anything legit. So let's try this. Okay. Eight facts. There we go. One. Oh, <laughs> they come out the gates. Dang. Um, <laughs> number one, Jesus isn't part of the Trinity. Um, that's going to be an interesting thing to claim. Let's see. Let's see where they go with that. I don't know what they're going to say. Let's see. Okay. The word Trinity is never mentioned in the Bible. That is true. That doesn't mean that Jesus isn't a member of the Trinity. But the word Trinity is never mentioned in the Bible. That is 100% true, but not what I think they're going to claim it means. First used by the early church father, Tertullian. That could be legit. I actually don't know. Um, I, I don't know if that's accurate. Uh, it might be. But the, um, the term being coined... Uh, at that point, doesn't mean that it's not legitimate. There's all sorts of um, terms for theology and doctrine and uh, and so on that uh, we use now that they didn't have or that aren't technically scriptural. It's a way of summing up or explaining um, something that is a scriptural concept. Not everything directly word for word comes from the Bible. When you talk about theology, it's a single term that encompasses truth that you see in scripture. And you absolutely see the Trinity reflected in scripture. You see the father, God at Yahweh absolutely referred to as God. And so there's that the Shema in Deuteronomy six absolutely says there's only one God, but then you also have Jesus who is given all sorts of divine attributes, who is referred to as God repeatedly, who is worshiped as God, who claims unity in a unique way with the father in a way that nobody else does in a way that gets him crucified for blasphemy. They weren't wrong about the idea that Jesus was claiming to be God. And if he was wrong, if he was lying or if he was crazy and didn't know the difference, it actually was blasphemy. So his accusation was technically correct, except that he actually is God. He wasn't making it up or lying about it. And so then the he is divine. And then same with the Holy Spirit is referred to repeatedly as the Spirit of God. And so we know that these three are different. The Holy Spirit is, is a person sent by God, but he has his will and everything else. But he is also the Spirit of God and not just something created by God, but he is the full essence, power, and Spirit of God. And so we have this uniquely strange, these three different people uh, persons who are referred to as God individually and are not just uh, like modalism would say that, you know, the father's in heaven and then Jesus comes. And then when, you know, it's just God in the form of Jesus. And now one or twin powers activate form of Holy Spirit after Jesus goes back to heaven. That's not it either. It's not that the that God only operates in one mode at a time. The Trinitarian God is present Uniquely at the baptism of Jesus, we see all three present at once. And then there are hints of it all over scripture as well. But in the baptism of Jesus, Jesus is physically being baptized. The Holy Spirit descends as a dove on him and the voice of the Father from heaven separate from all of that. And so you have all three different places all acting in one moment at the same time. And so that's one of the clearest pictures we have of the Trinity. And then each of those members being talked about individually and together as one God. Uh, but so just because the word Trinity isn't in the Bible doesn't mean it's an unbiblical concept, but I digress. Let's continue. Let's see what they say. The council of Constantinople in 381. Okay. First formalize the concept. That doesn't mean it was invented then. That doesn't mean that that doctrine didn't exist before then. That means that they officially wrote it down, ratified it and said, 
as far as we're concerned, we are the church and we say this is a thing. And it was <clears throat> generally moments like that are not, that's the first time anybody came up with that. Tertullian came up with his new word. Let's go with that. That's not how that worked. That is the most ridiculous attack against the faith. The, uh, the ratifying or the formalizing, the, the signing into absolute unified agreement that the Trinity is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith was to refute those who claimed oneness theology, who claimed um, the heresy of modalism and, and uh, partialism and that kind of stuff. And so all of those things were refuted and said, no, no, this is the Trinity. This is how that works. We don't worship three gods. We don't worship one God in different modes or different parts of him. Is one God, each member is fully God and also fully um, individualized. And so that's, um, yeah, yeah. So it's the Trinity. Um, but this ridiculous video claiming that that's not in scripture uh, is making stuff up and then trying to twist the way they're presenting the history, trying to make it seem like, oh, they just made it up in 381. But that was just the first time that a council met and ratified that um, as the word for it and agreed on those terms to clarify anybody believing something otherwise is not actually adhering to Christian belief. So the Trinity was developed as a human attempt to understand the nature of God. That is not completely wrong, but it's being presented in a way that's trying to uh, attack the, the idea of the Trinity. And so, um, the, the Trinity was the concept of Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity was developed to explain our best understanding of the biblical description of who God is. That's what that was. So point one, I think that's probably the whole thing. Um, Trinity isn't in the Bible. True. But Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. Um, okay. Continuing. Let's see. Number two, Jesus was born to a sinless mother. Uh, I will agree. That's not actually biblical. Um, that is, I believe, more of a Catholic doctrine. Um, I don't know if the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox or Coptic Orthodox or Greek Orthodox, I have no idea if any of the Orthodox churches hold to that same sinless Mary, like St. Mary. Uh, the Protestant Christianity um, and I would say just biblical Christianity, there's nothing in scripture that outright tells us that Mary was sinless. It says she's highly favored by God, but it says that about a lot of different people. And the only sinless one is Christ. That is clearly established. So I would agree. That's not a thing. Point number two. Okay. I'll give you this one. Let's see what they say about it though. This idea was first propagated by St. Augustine. Oh, interesting. Famous theologian described the concept of the original sin. Yeah. Oh, okay. I know where this is going. I, I think this is going to be because, so the claim is that Mary didn't sin. And that's part of the reason why she didn't have sex. She had Jesus or was pregnant with Jesus before, um, copulation with another human. So <clears throat> it was passed to the newborn through intercourse. So Augustine invented the virgin birth. He didn't though. See the virgin birth is in there all over <laughs> both the New Testament and in Isaiah and several other places where it's mentioned. Um, Augustine did not invent the virgin birth. The virgin birth is in Luke. Um, it's clearly presented in how Mary responds to the angel telling her that she's going to be pregnant. She's like, but how is that going to happen? I have never been with a man. I'm a virgin. There's no other way to understand that. Um, in Isaiah, it talks about a virgin who will be with child. Um, and in Matthew, there's uh, um, a little bit of a connection to that too. That's part of what uh, why Joseph wants to um, divorce her and because she's pregnant. And he's like, obviously she cheated on me because the only way you have babies is by having sex. Everybody knew that then. Nobody was unsure about that. And th they understood how this worked. Um, and so the, the, and the angel says, no, no, don't worry. This was the thing from the Holy spirit. This is a mir miraculous fulfillment of prophecy. This is not, uh, Mary has not been unfaithful to you. And so, um, doesn't mean that Mary was sinless, but she did not, uh, she was a virgin, uh, and she was virgin mother, uh, to Jesus. 
I I don't hold to the idea again another Catholic doctrine that Mary never had sex after that. I think she and Joseph, it says that they consummated the marriage after Jesus was born. They waited until he was born to consummate the marriage. And then he has brothers. And I don't believe in the like, oh, they were adopted or Joseph's from a previous marriage or, um, you know, cousins who were just like brothers. I think they legitimately had kids after that. There's no reason to assume they didn't. Um, other than holding to Augustine's idea of, um, original sin. So, um, so yeah, that, um, let's see to explain Jesus purity, but it doesn't need to, Mary doesn't have to be sinless to explain Jesus purity. The virgin birth is not only f- about Jesus purity. It's about the, um, the miraculous event of that, that this is something that God is doing in a brand new, unique one, one time ever kind of a way. It's just something different. So the only talk, gospels that talk about it are Matthew and Luke. Hey, I feel like I said that already. Um, there is no reason to assume that that somehow lowers the credibility of the claim. Um, it's, it's it's such double speak in those who attack scripture to say like, no, oh, this is only found in two of the gospels. They will turn around and say this is found in all four all four gospels. It's obviously false too. It's like so just. If it exists, it's false. If it's not there, it's false. If everyone said it, it's false. If no one said it, it's false. It's just false. You just claim it's false no matter what evidence you're presented with. You're like, see, that proves it. Like, that's not how things work. Um, And that's not any reason to assume that that this isn't legit. Okay, but let's see. Both were written a century after Jesus. Not true. Most scholars um, do hold that these were written by, uh, well, Luke was written by a guy who spoke with eyewitnesses and he writes about that. There's no reason to, to assume that they were written so late. Um, some attackers of the scripture try to place them later, but um, it, it's not valid church tradition and all the historical evidence always points to these being uh, first century documents written by the people that were, they were attributed, attributed to. Okay. All right. So far, number one was garbage. Uh, well, I mean, it was correct technically, but its explanation was way off. Um, it was about Jesus and the Trinity. Number two was that the that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was sinless. I don't disagree with that. That is true, and it's not in the Bible. This one, number three, Jesus had no siblings, except that that literally is in Scripture. So um, let's look at this. This is the official doctrine of the Catholic Church. So again, I'm not a Catholic, so I don't hold to that doctrine. Um, and I, the Bible does say that James is the brother of Jesus, and it talks about Jude as well. And so, and there's hints and references that there are other siblings of Jesus. There's no reason to assume that Mary and Joseph. In fact, the Bible kind of hints that they did consummate the marriage after. Jesus was born. It says they waited to do it until he was born. So that means that implies that they did consummate it after he was born. (laughs) And there's no reason to assume that a healthy Jewish couple would not have more children. And so by all indications, they did because Jesus had a a couple of brothers. Um, And in fact, the conversion of his brothers to believing in and even martyrdom for uh, on behalf of his messiahship of him being who he said he was like that's a huge testimony to him being legitimately who he claimed to be that it converted his brother um his brothers so um anyway it's just on the list of things okay so uh this is the official doctrine of the catholic church that jesus didn't have siblings i do not believe it and i don't feel that it's biblical so this one okay i'll give it to that it ties up with the idea that Mary was a virgin. It It's denying that he had siblings as a way of keeping Mary pure through her whole life, which is tied to the sinless Mary thing, which is another Catholic doctrine that I don't believe in or hold to and doesn't, doesn't have any necessary connection to scripture. Um, also, some of these pictures are super good and some of them are super weird. Like some of the things are like very relevant and some of them are very odd. So this video is weird. Okay. However, the Bible says Jesus had a number of siblings. Correct. I just said that. Okay. One of them was James. See? 
Catholic theologians sometimes say that James was a cousin, I bet. Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, I, number three, I don't believe in that one either. So I, I don't call that a fact about Jesus. Okay, let's talk about December 25th is Jesus' birthday. Because yeah, that's not in the Bible. That's the whole thing. This video is eight facts about Jesus that aren't actually in the Bible. This one isn't in the Bible. You're right. Nothing says December 25th is when he was born. All right. Let's see what they say about it, though. None of the Gospels mention Jesus' birth date. That's correct. Look at that. There's no indication what season Jesus was born in. There are some indications, but there's always work around. So there's really great arguments for both sides of things. Um, there's talk about, um, you know, the fact that the shepherds were out in the fields may imply that it's warmer weather. They probably wouldn't do that in the winter, although it's not like there's like deep snow. And, you know, I mean, like Israel's not in the Alps. You know, Bethlehem is is uh, um, it's a fairly temperate region. It's the same latitude as Southern California. Um, so it it shouldn't be um, shouldn't be considered that crazily um, unthinkable that they'd still be out uh, even in winter. Um, but, you know, it there's a lot of different ways to understand it. And, yeah, there's no clear date given. So. Um, it was set to align with, most likely it was set to align with um, kind of hijacking other things and, and turning them into making them about Jesus. But picking a random date and using it to worship Jesus um, doesn't mean that we didn't worship Jesus. Um, so I, I don't, I don't, December 25 isn't biblical, but it's not exactly like unchristian either. December 25th is a tradition that was born. What are they going to claim? Much later. Good point. Christmas wasn't celebrated until about 330 AD. Cool. Uh, December 25 was likely chosen to coincide with Roman Saturnalia. There's a lot of different, you know, pagan holidays that uh, potentially connect to this. There's so much weird mythology and stuff. And then there's all sorts of random things where different cultures like do their best to eradicate all opposing things or things they take over. And so it's hard to know all of the facts because there's a lot of different legitimate sources that present different ideas, but it's not that, um, it's not that crucial. Um, you know, celebrate Jesus birth. Uh, it's a time to talk about all of that and, um, you know, be excited about what Jesus has done. So I don't know. Um, here we go. Some crazy conversations happening in that right now. It replaced the early pagan, earlier pagan holiday. So that's the, that's the claim. Ooh, Jesus was celibate. Ooh, that's, you know, let's get into that one in a minute. Okay. Um, let's back up just a little bit. Okay. We'll leave it there for now. I don't know. Number five. Let's see. <laughs> let's see what it is. Number five. Jesus was celibate. Okay. Uh, it says that that wasn't in scripture. Um, what is not in the Bible. This one I would debate. I don't think there's any reason to think that Jesus was married. There's absolutely nothing that gives us an indication of that. And there's literally no reason to think that he would have been sexually active without being married. Um, that was a very frowned upon thing in their culture um and while it was pretty widespread it was still frowned upon and it was definitely not considered righteous and so um uh so anyway um let's see what they say about this because usually it's like okay well technically i like those words aren't in scripture but i think the biblical account of who christ is would lead us to the conclusion that he was celibate but let's see what it says. The video says, New Testament doesn't say that Jesus had a wife. That's true. But there's no mention of him being single either. Well, for that, I mean, maybe he had four arms. The Bible doesn't mention the number of arms he had. Maybe he only had three fingers. 
The Bible doesn't mention the number of fingers he had. It never, there's no scriptures that have him counting his fingers. Like just randomly making up stuff like, well, the Bible didn't say that. Like, so I mean, okay, you do you, but it, it doesn't fit. So when there's, when the Bible doesn't speak to something, we take the rest of scripture and we evaluate it all based on that and go, well, what makes the most sense here? And claiming that Jesus had sexual relations or was married is unreasonable. Doesn't fit. All right. For a man of Jesus' age, it would have been very unusual for him to be single. Yes. And yet, <laughs> here he was. Um, there was a lot about the life of Jesus that would have been very unusual. That's okay. All right. The idea of Jesus' celibacy was first proposed by Tertullian. No. The idea of Jesus' celibacy was first proposed by Tertullian as part of ratifying certain doctrines about who Jesus was. Things that the church already believed and taught. And in particular, some of the stuff being addressed at these councils where Tertullian was present in the mid to late 300s, some of the, the heresies that were really taking a lot of steam, one in particular was Gnosticism, which was really strongly trying to make a case that there's spirit and flesh in such separate ways that the spirit is all good, the flesh is all bad, so it doesn't matter what you do. Paul clearly refutes that idea in Romans, says, what, should we just go on sinning then? No, absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. And he goes on to make that whole case. Read Romans 6 and 7, uh, 5, 6, and 7 for more on that, and then even into 8. But... um. But uh, Tertullian bringing this up and getting it written down and included does not mean he's the first one to ever come up with it. I, I hate this kind of just random, you know, misapplying of scripture and just like, hey, let's misrepresent this and make it sound like it's something else when it's not. All right. The church father argued that Jesus must have been celibate to remain sinless. Well, yeah, since he's not married, he can't have had sex and be sinless um, but it's it's not that they had to come up with these rules to maintain this false idea that he was sinless or they had to just make up things and ignore evidence or anything like that like to say it like that makes it sound shady it's a false presentation of things that is like oh you know it like Take it super current times right now. Uh, at the time we're filming this, the Johnny Depp, Amber Heard stuff has been going on, right? And Amber Heard has all these things where she's like, nobody's going to believe you because they're, who are they? they're not going to believe that given the context and everything else. I'm going to twist it and make it sound. And then people are hearing her say that. And they're like, wow, you are a horrible human being. And so it's that kind of, that's this kind of thing. It's like, I'm going to misrepresent this. I'm going to say things that are technically sort of true, but I'm going to say them in a way that kind of paints it like, Ooh, look what they did. And it's like, you're saying that like there was something wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with that. As part of continuing with the doctrine that Jesus is sinless and also looking at scripture and looking at his life and going, Hey, hang on. He's single. He would have, as just a pious man, much less the Messiah, would have stayed celibate if not married. And so, yeah, anyway. Jesus had fair skin. No, he didn't. Um, granted, looking at a lot of Catholic imagery, I can see how you would be misled to think that because here's a picture of like Jesus with like, probably my skin tone once you take away the weird coloring faded of the thing and then but like green blue eyes yeah probably not middle eastern jew in the first century probably dark dark hair probably dark brown eyes maybe golden uh probably dark fairly dark skin like a solid middle eastern brown tone yeah you know like everyone who lives in the middle east like it's not that hard figure out I don't know like 
this has been a popular thing lately. Like people keep like, I see people come through and troll in, in Christian videos. Jesus wasn't white. Like cool story. And who said he was like, what are you addressing? He's just like randomly run around the streets and yell things at people. Like, okay. Anyway, our dominant image of Jesus comes from, I don't know, the Italian Renaissance. Yeah. So see, not even the Renaissance artists made no efforts to accurately depict what Jesus looks like, looked like, right. They literally like, if you study art, which I was an art major before I got into Bible. If you study how the Renaissance painters in particular um, went about their artistic designs, they used the people they had around them. So did like the Greeks, like, uh, or, and um, a lot of people, like all the sculptures and things like they used the people around them as references for painting. It wasn't about uh, references for their art. It wasn't about capturing the essence of who that person might have been. It was just about trying to get something that looked, you know, beautiful. And half the stuff was like explorations in form and shading and lighting and everything else more than it was about like, yeah, that's definitely an exact picture of who that guy was. Like, no, like whatever random picture of Jesus, like, uh, who was it? Um, I think Rembrandt, um, almost everybody in his paintings is him. He was his own model. He looked in a mirror and he uses himself as the reference for most of his portraits. And so he's present in all of even women. Like, I mean, it, so it's like, that's not a, like, so what? <laughs> so yeah, if they did, they would have been thrown out of town. Why? That's weird. I don't know why. Instead, they painted Jesus as a white skinned man with European features because they were European painters and they were using other Europeans as references. Okay. Jesus was Middle Eastern and Jewish. Yes. Correct. Not a scandal. Like, literally. Yes. Okay. Um, so he likely had darker olive skin. No. Uh, no, duh. Yes, he did. Sorry. <laughs> yes. He likely had darker olive skin. All right. Okay. Let's check this out. <laughs> Number seven. Jesus conducted his teachings in Greek. That's not in the Bible. The first version of the Bible was written in Greek. However, it's not likely that Jesus taught in this language. Yeah, he probably taught in Aramaic. Um, there are a few Aramaic words recorded. Um I don't know why Jesus spoke or taught in Greek is a fact that they're disproving in this. Certainly likely that Jesus spoke at least a little bit of Greek conversationally because that would have been the Roman language at the time. Uh, he for sure spoke Hebrew and probably the common language was Aramaic. And it's not unreasonable. Even in most other countries, like Americans have this idea that like only speak English, only one language, like, most people in other countries these days are, are multilingual. Um, a lot of people speak English and their country's language, and especially like in Europe, uh, it's not uncommon that people speak three or four or more languages. So that's silly that, um, that this is like somehow a disproving thing. I've never heard anybody uh, try to make the case that Jesus exclu exclusively taught in or spoke Greek. So... I don't know what the point of this is. So this is most likely Jesus rarely, if ever, taught in Greek. Sure, maybe. He that one easy, like what who cares? Okay. Jesus' birth was attended by three wise men. Yeah. Also, yeah, false. That's easy. Um the there's a whole bunch of indicators. Let's see what they say here. Um, but yeah, um I had a I actually had a pastor who would take the um the nativity scene and take the three wise men and like move them like way far out. Like he would set up a little nativity scene and be like, all right, three wise men. And he like put them in the backyard or something. Cause they're not going to be here for a while. Funny, silly, but anyway, so whatever. So let's see why the wise men bearing gifts are barely mentioned in the gospels. Matthew two, one says now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, 
of Judea in the king in the days of Herod the king. Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. It doesn't say there were three of them. That's right. Usually there's assumed to be three because of the three gifts. Um, and yeah, kings, uh, they're probably, they're probably astrologers, really, because um, they were watching the stars. So there's some sort of astrologer, or magicians or something, magi, something like that is more likely. Um but his birth wasn't attended by three strangers. Okay, this is weird. Okay, anyway. Um, yeah, it, the, and then the timing of the account is presented as, um, you know, when Herod calls for the execution of uh, children in that region um, after the wise men don't return and report Jesus' location to him, um, he goes after every kid under two, which implies that, like, there was a longer timeline between when the wise men showed up with their gifts. And so, um, I don't know, maybe there were three guys, maybe there were 30, who knows? Um, somebody else. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, I, only a couple of those facts were like really worth doing. Mostly it seemed like it was just there to tear down, uh, or just to strike little seed. So seeds of unsurety, in people and just kind of try and degrade the uh, validity of uh, faith or the Bible. Like the things you think, you know, aren't true. And it's like, but I didn't think any of those were true to begin with. So whatever. Um, so anyway, less impressive. Anyway, that's pastor reacts. If you like that, subscribe, click the button, share it with a friend, tell somebody or leave a horrible scathing comment. Attack me over things that have nothing to do with this video. Completely up to you. It'd be really helpful, though, if you comment what you think I should react to next. That's way better. All right. Peace. Be rad for Jesus.